stop sharing. Yeah, so, I'll try to share now if, if it works. Yes, right? yes, yes. Uh, give me a sec. Um, uh, so, uh, Aliyaj Gudetz from uh, Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. Uh, and you will be talking about dimensionality in uh, sample path statistical mechanics. Thank and you why... very much, Jan. Yeah. Uh, also, so thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasant surprise. Um, so I, I will apologize because I will skip a couple of slides. I thought I had 30 minutes. I had 20 only. So um, I invite you to ask me during the discussion about the slides. I will skip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> take, take your time. Uh, apologize up front. Just... No, no, no. It will be extremely interesting. We are looking forward. Um, thank you very much. Um, so uh, maybe I will give a little bit of a background before I uh, give you the outline of the lecture, uh, why I chose this title and uh, why uh, the specific structure of my talk. Uh, so it was motivated by some recent reports we got, which were not negative um, at all, but nevertheless, they um, sort of raised a little bit of concern and we weren't fully uh, uh, able to understand them and basically what they were saying is that we should not phrase our results uh, in higher dimensions because um, everything or most of the basic and fundamental physics can be learned from one dimensional systems anyhow uh, so everything that is past that is basically just a blow up and complication of notation uh, so what I will try to do in my talk today is maybe give some arguments that that's not necessarily the case and maybe highlight that the one dimensional systems, as much as we like them, because we can solve them and we can understand them in detail, are somewhat singular and that we should not overrate the, the insight we get from, from that. Um, so this will be the outline of my talk. Uh, so I'm supposed to tell you something about the fundamentals. So I will start with the fundamentals of the fundamentals and then I will give a motivation. And then uh, I will try to explain what I mean by sample path statistical mechanics. Uh, so it's going to be re strongly related to stochastic thermodynamics, but it's not going to be about thermodynamic potentials today, at least not mostly. Uh, then I will give some, some um, facts about um, diffusion processes, which you may know or should know, or you just should recall. So this, the titles here or the sections in black are basically textbook stuff. And then I will have two sections where I will present some results or actually just highlight them or maybe briefly mention them. Uh, and one is um, what I understand as um, the green kubo principle for uh, path observables or uh, green kubo principle for functionals um, in, in the sense that what we can learn about the physics of dynamical fluctuations. And uh, in the final part, I want to highlight that there is actually a fundamental need for spatial coarse graining in statistical physics. And then I will finish. Um, okay, so uh, since I understand that not everyone in the audience is an expert, so there were, Edgar mentioned that there are some students present. I wanted to give a little bit of a broader overview. It's going to be very superficial. Uh, so what I mean is that in my universe, uh, I'm describing systems that as a whole with all degrees of freedom are mechanical. So they obey Newton's equations of motion or some fancy rewriting like Lagrange on Hamilton. So I have two n degrees of freedom. They evolve according to Newton's equations of motion. Of course, I cannot observe them all. Uh, and as it happens, uh, I often get lucky or we often get lucky that uh, many of those degrees of freedom are actually evolving much faster so that we can actually effectively integrate them out and replace them uh, with some friction um, and some noise term, which is scaled by, by the square root of the friction. So this acts like a thermostat. Um, of course, while we go from deterministic to stochastic to the Langevin equation, we already lose some temporal resolution. And that is, we don't see anything which is faster than those degrees of freedom we ignore. Uh, now, in addition to that, we are often also lucky in the sense that also the momentum is much faster than um, the positions or we can uh, also think about momentum relaxing infinitely fast. So then we get to overdone Langevin equations. So this is the type of uh, dynamics I will talk about. Uh, so this is how we typically start by assuming that this is some fundamental equation of motion. It's not. It's just fundamental on some relevant time scale and under a given setting. And this is a stochastic differential equation just for the positions. Uh, and now we don't have forces anymore, but we rather have drifts. And if the system has a stationary state, there, are always, there is always a component uh, deriving from the potential. So this first part here is time reversible. So this is the time reversible drift. And then we have something that drives the system out of equilibrium. And then again, noise scaled by the diffusion constant. Uh, 
And if we get lucky in the sense as well that this potential contains many deep basins that are separated by high free energy barriers, uh, then on, a, on an even longer time scale, which is longer than the relaxation in these basins, we can actually obtain a Markov jump process. Um, so this Markov jump process has then M states. And uh, the reason is that the generator of the dynamics of this Overland uh, dynamics has a gap between the low li the first low lying uh, M eigenvalues. And this means that the Markov process we are observing is actually just a process in the subspace of the lowest lying first eigenvectors. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make here that as we go from the more fundamental Newton's equations of motion to the stochastic equations of motion, which we assume often as a startup, there is necessarily a temporal resolution involved. Um, so this means that if I make a statement about under them, oh, over them Langevin dynamics, I most likely also make a statement of uh, for, for Markov jump dynamics, but it doesn't work the other way around. At least not if I assume that the system as a whole is um, mechanical. And I will stick today to overdumped Langevin equations. I will make this more precise a little bit later. Okay, so what I mean now by path-based statistical mechanics is what has already been mentioned today. Uh, so what I, what I have is I have in mind some experiments which generate trajectories of some process. We record them as a time series. And uh, unless we have a superbly uh, laborious PhD student or postdoc, we cannot generate a proper ensemble to do ensemble averaging. We cannot repeat the experiment 10 to 20 times or something like that. So we have a finite set of trajectories that are typically finite uh, of a finite duration. So what we do is we basically time average. We, we analyze the data by time averaging. And because the trajectories that we are observing are stochastic, then also the time average is stochastic. And now we are interested in this sample to sample fluctuations of our uh, time average observables. Uh, and what is often also involved is that in general experiments are not infinitely precise. This has also been mentioned a couple of times today. So there is some sort of coarse graining over a scale involved in any natural experiment. Uh, some experiment also record just some low dimensional projection of some of the high dimensional dynamics I was talking about before. So it can also be a one dimensional observable like an extension of a macromolecule observed by force spectroscopy or plasmon rulers. Uh, so this now really is a one dimensional process, but you can imagine that this process will not be Markovian. It will have memory at least on reasonably long uh, time scales. Uh, and also questions like time reversal symmetry and dissipation in the presence of such low dimensional projections become uh, much more intricate and much deeper. I will not discuss that today. Uh, I will just recall that Stochastic thermodynamics, we assume that everything we are not observing is infinitely fast, at least as far as the full system is concerned. So um, we are assuming the so-called local detail balance paradigm. So when I will talk about the dimensionality of the system, I'm not referring to the dimensionality of the observable, but rather the dimensionality of the full system. I can, on top of that, make some observation. I just want to clarify that. Okay, so what I will assume is that I can find some overdumped stochastic representation of my full system's dynamics. So it's D-dimensional in general. It obeys this overdumped stochastic differential equation. In eta form here, F is the drift, uh, which I will assume is, is smooth. So has a bounded uh, local variation such that the, uh, a unique solution of this differential equation exists. Sigma is the noise intensity, which just scales the noise and V of T here, W of T will be uh, the D-dimensional linear process. I will also assume that the drift is sufficiently confining so that my system will find eventually a stationary state. This stationary state will have an invariant density P sub S. And it, if it's out of equilibrium, it will also have an invariant current, which I denote by JS. And this uh, invariant current has zero divergence. Otherwise, we cannot have a um, stationary state. So if we are now far, away, far from equilibrium, out of equilibrium, we don't need only the invariant density to do the statistics, but we also need the uh, invariant current. I will phrase the results in a slightly more general setting. You don't have to bother with that, but I just want to um, sort of declare it as it won't be surprised because I will assume that just for the sake of generality, my noise can be position dependent. Uh, it will not change anything except that I also assume that this noise intensity is also a sufficiently smooth function where it sufficiently smoothly varies in space. Otherwise, you can also ignore this part. And I need to take a little bit of care about how to in interpret this differential equation, but it's not really a big concern. Uh, okay, so as I said, we now need two things in order to describe the system. We need an invariant density or the steady state density and the steady state current. And this is a very hard problem uh, in, to solve for this is in general, nearly impossible or 
by nearly, I mean, fully impossible in general. But what we know roughly is the structure of uh, or the decomposition of this drift field. So if the system has a stationary state, we always have a, a time reversible component of the drift. So this is this part in blue and something which is time irreversible. So whenever this part in red is non-zero, we have broken detail balance. And A here is an anti-symmetric matrix field. So this irreversible drift always has two components, one that is locally orthogonal to the potential field and one that may have a projection also into this field. And the spatial dependence of this anti-symmetric field basically tells us if the current is constant along level, level sets of, of uh, the invariant density or if it varies. Um, so the generator of the dynamics is, is the Fokker-Planck operator. I write it here in a form which separates the time reversible part in blue and the time irreversible part in, in, in red. And it's a uh, joint. Uh, and then the transition probability uh, density G tells us what is the probability density to transition from some state Y to some state X in a time T, which is given by this propagator. And we know that unless we have that the steady state current or this irreversible component vanishes, we don't have detailed balance, but we have something which is called a generalized time reversal symmetry or dual reversal symmetry, which basically states that the probability density to go from, from Y to X in time T is the same as the probability density to make a reverse transition, but if we simultaneously also invert this irreversible part of the current. And I will use this dual reversal symmetry later on to um, when I will try to um, rationalize this green cubic type formulas. And finally, uh, I assume that the system is strongly ergodic, so I assumed it with this strong confinement condition, and it basically says that after a finite but potentially large time, which is much larger than some uh, longest relaxation time, uh, the probability density function of the system would be exponentially close uh, to the invariant measure, irrespective of what is the initial condition. Okay. Uh, so, so far, this has been all ensemble averages. So this is basically what we cannot infer um, unless we have sufficiently many trajectories, et cetera. So now the question is, what are the path-based estimators of this invariant density and current? Okay, so now we want to infer this from a finite number of individual trajectories. There can also be a lot of in, uh, individual trajectories. And of course, we are not the first to ask this question. Uh, the answer comes in the form of so-called the empirical density and empirical current. Uh, so the empirical density basically reflects the fraction of time the process x tau spans at some in the vicinity of some point x or at some point x. And the empirical current basically measures the time average current through this point. And this circle dx here, just a Stratonovich differential, which should not be any concern. You can just think about it as the correct way of writing an integral over the velocity if this velocity nowhere exists. Okay, and, and delta here is the Dirac delta function, which means we are thinking about some limit of some distribution, say Gaussian or anything that actually converges in that sense. And what has been found is that these type of observables, when averaged over an ensemble of steady state paths, so paths propagating from the steady state distribution, on average actually give the steady state density and the steady state current. So this is what we, what we like to have. And it was also found that in dimension one, so when this X of tau is one dimensional, also, other moments are well behaved, and um, there are um, actually no problems. We don't have to worry about much. So we tried initially to figure out how to extend this to high dimensional systems. So when d is larger than one, and then we failed. We simply were not able to understand what these equations means. We still cannot, but at least now we know why we cannot. Uh, so I will try to explain why there is really some conceptual part missing as we go from dimension one to higher dimensions. Um, so I will list now a couple of textbook properties of diffusion in dimension one and other uh, out of dimension one. So in dimension one, so first of all, we know that the diffusion overdump diffusion processes are locally dominated by by Brownian motion. So this is a well known fact. Uh, but I will assume still that I have a confinement so that my process is uh, ergodic, so it settles into a stationary state. And what we know is that with probability one the diffusion process in 1D hits any point starting from any initial condition. It actually hits this point infinitely often. Um, and it also returns uh, to the point infinitely often in, in, in a large enough time. Uh, we know that along each individual tra uh, trajectory, the empirical density and current that we will infer will converge almost surely to the steady state density and the steady state current. So this is all not beautiful. 
there exists something which is the correlation time. So after a certain finite time scale, the value of the, those two observables at two different times will be essentially uncorrelated. So this is also nice because we can use large deviation principles, et cetera. Uh, but then again, we also know that the non-equilibrium steady state of such processes is trivial. Uh, so first of all, it exists only with periodic boundary conditions. If there are no periodic boundary conditions, a steady state without explicit time dependence in the, the driving cannot exist. Uh, and the triviality comes from the fact that the gradient and divergence in 1D are the same. So if I say that the current is divergence-free, this means it's constant. So you can imagine in higher dimensions, this is not the case. And also dynamical functionals, such as this uh, time, in, uh, time average current, are trivial because they're not really functionals, uh, because an antiderivative always exists. So they basically contain a part which just depends on the initial and end points. So it's plus, minus 1, and 0 in the case of empirical currents, plus something which just reflects the number of terms. So all the path dependence comes into this number of terms, which actually dominates as t goes to infinity. Now, in higher dimensions, things are different. So diffusion never hits points. So with probability zero, it hits any point. It, it also with probability zero, it returns to any point. Um, I will show later that these two observables defined as a delta function doesn't, they don't really seem to be mathematically well-defined. There is no such thing as a correlation time. Uh, also non-equilibrium steady states are in general highly non-trivial simply because there is a big difference between divergence and gradient and this fries, this opens up plenty of possibilities for to generate non-equilibrium steady states that are not trivial. Also functionals are genuinely path dependent so there is no, anti in general antiderivatives don't exist. So in that sense I would really say that the D1 case is singular. And the insight that we get from these one-dimensional models, as much as we like them and as much as we use them, may not be so representative. So we need to, we need to, we should be forced to think about also what happens in higher dimensions. Okay. Uh, so now we return to this problem. We try to define um, those empirical densities and empirical currents uh, differently. So we say instead of putting in a delta function, we just put in a distributional representation like a Gaussian or any uh, differentiable square integrable function which uh, is translation invariant. So this means that uh, the dependence around the, the centroid just enters as a difference. Uh, and that in the limit, when we take this parameter H, which measures the extent of the coarse graining with this window function, as we call it, uh, goes to a delta function. So if all goes well, when we do the analysis and take the limit H to zero, nothing can go wrong. Uh, otherwise, something can go wrong, we will see. So what we are measuring here is basically the fraction of time spent in this window, averaged over the volume of this window, and the sum of the displacements through this window. And the displacement vectors are basically the points spanning en uh, entrance and exit points of this window, and then added up to the trajectory, OK? So I will skip now this side remark. One can also define this for uh, other more general types of currents and then prove thermodynamic uncertainty relations. But unfortunately, I don't have time to that. So I will basically try to illustrate what these observables look like. So what I'm showing you here is a two-dimensional irreversible ornstein ulmbeck process. So there is a curl which drives the system, um, say here, clockwise. And I'm, I'm showing you the statistics of the current. So it's an X component of the current along this red line, okay, the, defined with a Gaussian. So you see initially it has a negative component because the current goes to the left. As we move further on, it goes through a zero, and then as we continue, it then becomes positive. And the blue line measures the ensemble average of this uh, component of the current, and the gray area are plus minus standard deviations. So this is basically how much we should worry about how significant or how um, reliable our uh, estimate from such a bundle of trajectories would be. And now we are interested what happens when we take this h to zero, okay? Um, so first thing, what I can tell you is that if we define those uh, empirical densities and currents with a window function, they almost surely converge as t goes to infinity to the steady state versions. So along in all each individual part. So the, the process is really strongly ergodic. So these are now steady state density and currents integrated over the window function for any positive h, right? So for any arbitrarily small window function. And the other thing what we can show is that the continuity equation holds pathwise. So there is an equation, there is a continuity equation which connects these two arbitrarily rough probability measures, uh, but the, the spatial derivatives are in the centroid position. So there is no, um, there, there is nothing spectacular there and that's so it's just neat. Okay, but now we want to go higher. Uh, we want to look at higher moments. And what I want to look at is just covariances at two different points, x, y, 
and AB are either the empirical density and current. And I want to look, just look at the results if I consider an ensemble of steady state initial conditions. The general uh, initial case is, is, uh, can be found in this paper cited here. Um, and what I want to find is, or what I'm anticipating is that, you know, in statistical physics, whenever we are looking at variances and covariances of observables, we know that they are somehow related to time correlations. So time integrals of autocorrelation functions via green Kubo formulas. So now we are interested, what would be the green Kubo analog of a function? Okay. So now by direct computation using stochastic calculus, one can isolate this green Kubo type thing. So there are two integrals over time and then there are two integrals over space which basically just localize um our, our observable at two different points x and y or actually in a neighborhood with rate with, with size h around these points uh, i will not talk about the density correlation function because this has been to a large extent explained already by darling and cuts and in the 50s which already knew that one should not put in a delta function um and i will just focus on the covariances and correlations and um what pops up immediately is that these uh, observables relate to time reversal quite natu naturally. So in a sense, what they measure is in the covariance between density and current is the so-called Stratonovich increment along pin paths. So these are paths that propagate between two fixed points in, in time. And they look at the initial increment and the final increment along the time reverse paths. So these increments are basically sample path representations of probability currents. And in the case of um, current fluctuations or current covariances, they are actually so scalar products between these initial and endpoint um, increments along pin trajectories. And if you look at variances, so when x is equal to y, what they measure is basically correlations between outgoing and incoming increments along loops of different length. So this is basically what, what these measure. Okay, but now the problem is that while the endpoint increments are easy to calculate because these are just probability currents, the initial ones are very hard because this is initial increment conditioned on the endpoint, and this is a hard problem. Uh, and there are several ways how to uh, evaluate such correlation functions, which I will skip uh, due to time. Uh, I will just try to give you a physical intuition how one can uh, use time reversal, dual, dual reversal symmetry to evaluate them. So we want to have, so this is now an ensemble propagating from X to Y. The mean path is denoted by this line here. And what we are interested in is the initial point current condition now that all trajectories hit that point here. So this is hard. Uh, we know that this is not the same as the final point current for the time reversed um, traject path ensemble, simply because they are not the same. You see that the mean path is different, it goes the other way around. But we know that it's it can be inferred from the dual reverse, so reverting time and reverting the irreversible part, which in this case here is just the shear flow, which we get this green arrow. But now we just need to um, flip it. So we just need to reflect it. You see that minus the green arrow is exactly the blue arrow. And this is how we can compute all those observables. And then it turns out that these green Kubo formulas are really just correlations between outgoing and incoming probability currents along pin paths. Okay, so basically this is what the green Kubo principle here is. It's slightly more complicated than that, uh, but I, I cannot really go into the details. It's just that we can relate now fluctuations and correlations of this functional to something that refers to time reversal symmetry and it's breaking. And in particular, if the steady state current vanishes, so if we are in, if we have time reversal symmetry, then at no time there are correlations between the steady, between the current and, and the density, so they vanish. Whenever this thing here is positive, uh, we have broken detail balance. So this is also the physics that we gain from that. Okay, I will skip this example now as well. And now I come to the limit when h goes to zero. Um, so now this means I'm taking the limit to the delta function. And what we find is that the variance uh, of both the density and the current diverges for any time t. Uh, so now this is a problem because this means that when we take the limit h to zero first and t to infinity later, this doesn't commute with taking the limit t to infinity first and h to zero later, so which means that we cannot or must not use a delta function in the initial um, definition. Um, what will come soon, we are just preparing it, is, is a, an analogous result for level two large deviations from this empirical density. So not, so far I consider just the empirical density in a single point, but we can now also consider the entire field, so the empirical density everywhere. 
And one can compute this with level two large deviations. Hugo Touchet gave a beautiful lecture on, on Thursday about that, so I, can, I must not go into detail there. Uh, and in detailed balance, the rate function that enters large deviation principle is given here by the integral, and one can use that to compute uh, the L2 norm now uh, of deviations from the empirical density from this invariant measure, and they also diverge. So it doesn't just diverge in a single point, it also diverge if we consider the entire field. Okay, so now we have a, we are in a bit of a pickle uh, because we have something where the first moments converge and we can take the limit, but the second moment diverges. And uh, if you think about what happens is that almost surely uh, each individual trajectory will give us a zero. Right, so we can show by numerical experiments and now by also by theory that if we consider long enough trajectories, the empirical density and current will always go to zero. Uh, so we have a first moment finite, second moment infinite, and all individualization is zero. This might be considered as being a bit odd. It's really not. So here is a minimal example that can explain this in terms of a Bernoulli observable. Uh, so if I if I define a random variable such that I say it with probability one minus n, it attains a value n, and with probability one minus one over n, a zero, then this observable will almost surely in the limit n to infinity go to zero. It will have a finite mean, which is equal to one, and it will have infinite fluctuations in the limit n to infinity. Um, so this just highlights what is known in probability theory that there are very different types of convergence in the mean, in probability, in distribution, etc., which one now also has to uh, consider while doing physics. So it's not just to so that we can sleep better. Okay, I will skip this as well. And now I will just come to the final part, which is um, basically how one now can use this flexibility that we now have by having the possibility to coarse grain our observables instead of um, understanding them as a necessity uh, for coarse graining is if we use the thermodynamic uncertainty relation to try to infer a bound on the dissipation here given by this sigma. Uh, so the thermodynamic uncertainty relation in, in this vanilla steady state form tells us that the variance of some observed current divided by the mean current squared is always bigger than two over t times the steady state dissipation. And what we do now is we choose the empirical current as we define it with a finite window. And now we consider this left-hand side of the thermodynamic uncertainty relation as a function of the coarse grain. Right, and now we know that as h goes to zero, the variance will go to infinity, so this bound uh, will become poor. And as h goes to infinity, the mean will go to zero, so the left-hand side will again become poor. So this must this means that must be some sweet spot in between. And indeed, it's true. It they have they, it can have many local minima, but in general, there is always at least one sweet spot where uh, by just coarse graining the the spatial resolution we can make the thermodynamic uncertainty relation sharper. And then this allows us to infer a tighter bound on the steady state dissipation just by coarse grain. So we don't have to repeat the experiment or anything. And uh, this brings me to, to my end and I'm already a couple of minutes over, so I apologized. Um, so I tried to convince you that uh, path-based statistical physics does require coarse graining in dimensions greater than one, but not in one. So there is one difference, quite a big one, I would say. Um, I try to explain or highlight that fluctuations of those observables encode information about time reversal symmetry and its breaking in terms of green Kubo formulas. Um, I, and my main case was that although the one dimensional case is practical, intuitive, we like it, we, we always use it, we should not overrate the insight we can get from one dimensional examples only. So there is much more physics in higher dimensions. Uh, and as an outlook, of course, now we need to do this for under them dynamics and functionals of projected normal cognitive paths. And with this, I would like to uh, thank the funding agencies for generous funding, you for your attention. Uh, and I will also just briefly state that there are positions available. So if someone is interested, please drop me an email. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Al, just for the talk. Uh, I switch with Jan, the chair, because he has to leave.